Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to be going over ADF slash NDB navigation. The NDB is the station. The ADF is the thing that points to it. Let's get started. So we have here ourselves the excellent Black Square Beechcraft Baron. Now, this is the uh, turbo, oh, nice pressurized version here. It is not a turbo prop. That'd be cool, but it is uh, just the regular kind of version here. We're cruising along very, very smoothly, as you can see here at the roof of the earth. Uh, you just get an idea of Ken, uh, Himalayas and everything in the distance. And uh, we need to find ourselves an airport to go ahead and land at. And for this purposes today, we don't have any GPS or anything fancy like that. As you can see, we're going to be using our lovely NDB and ADF. So let's take a look at our scenario here. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the NAF map, it is a fabulous, fabulous tool here. And you can see we're just kind of cruising along here. There's a nice little lake kind of below us. And again, this is for demonstration purposes. Now, if you take a look at any uh, sectional chart and you see these little guys here that are basically these dots with these uh, kind of radiating pieces coming out from them, these are NDB stations, also known as non-directional beacons. What they basically do is electronically yell, hey, everyone, I'm over here. Now, that's awesome because we have instruments inside the plane that will point towards one of those instruments. So the one thing we need to know about it, of course, other than where it is, so we know roughly where we are, is we need to know what its frequency is. And if I look at the bottom here, I can see the frequency for this one, Juliet Delta, is 475. So what we're going to do is we're going to head over to our tuner here, and we're going to dial in our 475. Now, this is called the ADF side of things. This is the automatic direction finder. In the old days, this was quite a process. These modern ones are nice, but you'll see there are some limitations. So let's go ahead and dial it in. So I need four, I need seven. Uh-oh, where's my five come from? It's actually pretty easy. Just right click on this and go ahead and crank it until you get it to the five. Excellent. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press the freak swap button and that's going to take that 475 and it's gonna load it in. Now, if you look over here, you'll notice this green needle on this is called an RMI. This is a kind of a non-standard way of doing this. Instantly starts pointing in a specific direction. Rule number one of non-directional beacon slash ADF navigation. The needle always points to the station. Now, that's a really good fact and actually sometimes works better than at VORs because we always know our orientation. Now, the interesting thing is in the old days, you had to actually crank the card here. But since this is an RMI, it'll actually stick the card where it wants. Now, there's something else you're probably noticing here. You can see that this needle is not pointing evenly in the direction we want to go. The reason it's not is because those signals are high frequency. They're very, very big, big big, big waves, and we're not going to be able to precisely measure one of those. So how are we going to get to that NDB? Well, we're going to execute a turn. I can see here that this NDB station is somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and crank my heading bug here to somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees. Uh, we'll pick 25 degrees. That seems pretty reasonable. Now, what you're going to notice is as the plane turns, uh, this needle is not going to freeze in place, but it's going to kind of stick. And the reason it's kind of sticking is uh, because of the electronics responsible for trying to identify where the strongest portion of the signal is. The way you actually used to do this is you'd have a basically a radio loop and what you do is you turn the radio loop and you'd read the electronic basically intensity and when the intensity peaked that would mean your radio loop is paid uh, pointing directly towards the station. Now keep in mind, there are a lot of atmospheric phenomena that makes this uh, very, very difficult to use. Now you'll notice here, we finished our turn up over uh, about a little couple degrees off of that one. I'll give us a couple taps here. Maybe it's uh, getting a little freezy freezy. It is uh, real world weather, by the way. So it's <laughs> a little cold outside, as you could probably imagine. But uh, the thing I'm noticing here is even though we executed our turn, we still look like that station is actually more north of us. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this thing. I'm gonna go ahead and crank it over to north. And um, don't let anybody tell you these mountains are not tall. <laughs> this is incredible. Like, you'll actually watch uh, my... Uh, we're only about 900 feet above that one. Watch this, watch this. Oh, 600 feet. We're a little low. Now, ADF and NDB has one advantage that VOR does not. And that is the fact that it is immune to land obstacles. If you look off my 12 o'clock here, you can see those massive, massive mountains in the distance right now. The NDB signal, I should say, actually ricochets off the atmosphere, meaning I can pick it up over mountains, which is unique to it. Now, I actually have a VOR station tuned in here uh, at our ultimate destination. And what you probably notice here is um, <laughs> I have no signal here. It, uh, even though we're picking up the distance to that particular station, I have no signal because the VOR 
far is line of sight only. So um, even though I'm getting the part of the signal that tells me how far I am, I'm not getting the part of the signal that tells me where I am. Now, what I notice here is after executing that turn, it's drifting back towards this particular component here. Um, completely natural, but you see how it's kind of swinging back and forth a little bit, giving me somewhere around 12 degrees. Uh, welcome to NDBs, by the way. In the real world, uh, this is about as reliable as they are. If you are playing uh, Flight Simulator 10 or earlier Flight Simulators, or you're flying one that has like the laser guided NDBs or something like that, um, you're not going to be fiddling with this aspect of this process this much. You know, you're going to have a pretty good idea of where it is and basically stick yourself in that direction. Now, let's see how well we did. Let me zoom out a little bit. And you can see we are more or less on course here. Uh, you can see that the NDB itself, remember when the needle is at the top, it doesn't matter what the outer ring says, we're pointing at it. So I'm looking carefully here and it seems we pretty much got it. Uh, we might be like a degree or two off to the left here. And you can kind of see that visually that we're a little off to it as well. But again, part of the fun, part of the fun. So I'm gonna gently adjust. And again, imagine doing this with a DC-3. <laughs> uh, one of the neat things about this region is uh, pilots who fly in and out of it so basically got combat pay. Uh, because of how incredibly dangerous this region is. Again, taking a pressurized plane is the way to go. And I'm noticing this is about at 12 o'clock. Now, this is where the problems are going to start magnifying themselves. What you're going to notice is as we start to get closer, this needle is going to appear to shift. Now, there's two reasons for that shift. Uh, first of all, we're getting a stronger signal so that the uh, system on board, the ADF component, is more confident about where it is. Um, that's going to be very true. The second problem we're going to have is something called wind. You all know about that wind. You know, got to watch out for those wind storms. <laughs> but uh, the reality is wind is going to make this process worse, especially when we are at longer distances because of the fact that you're going to be in a situation where the wind is essentially going to cause you to shift off target. Now, the neat thing here is if the wind was coming from my left, that would mean this needle would be shifting left as well. The wind will always make the needle go in the direction of itself. I know that sounds kind of neat, but the reality is, is because I'm being pushed this way, let me actually grab this, this will make more sense. If I get pushed this way, that's going to cause the needle to point towards it, which is going to make it point to the left. So the trick there is, of course, estimating how much of a deflection we're getting. Right now, we have basically no deflection. You can see uh, we're reading that signal pretty strong. But if I notice that needle was like over here at the north, what I would do is I'd take my airplane about five degrees past north and see if the needle stops moving. If the needle stops moving, that means we found the correct correction angle. Now, here comes the fun part. We want to land our airplane ultimately. So we're going to come up to this one here, and we're going to be taking a left and actually lining ourselves up for a landing here. Now, one of the cool things that they've done for us is they have put a series of inner and outer beacons here. You can see the 372 and the 732 here. These are basically going to be the navigational aids to get us on the ground. If you come on this side, you have 372 and 732. Now, the cool thing is we can put both of these into our computer and actually use them as a way to line ourselves up. Watch this. This is a slick trick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and do 372. There we go. Uh, we need to go ahead and pull the thing out so we can get the sevens. Good. Now I'm going to go ahead and swap that. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put in the 732 as well. So I'm going to come in here and do 7. We'll go 30. And we'll do 2. Now, what does that mean for us? That means that if we were to take a turn and both of those needles were at the same spot, that would mean we're perfectly lined up with that runway. Now watch this. So if I were to swap these, do you notice how one is slightly shifting right there? Perfect. Let's go ahead and take our left turn and get ready for our landing. Now we're going to use the same exact principle we used before. Ooh, sleepy morning here. <laughs> How cold is it in this plane? It's only 75. Oh, it's delightful in here, actually. But I have not checked in a while as my engine temperatures. Let's just take a quick look. Eh, we can probably close up the cow flaps a little bit. There we go. Nice. So what we're doing now is we're executing our left turn to get ourselves ready for landing. What we need to do now is we need to get both of the beacons to be centered. Now, this is a really slick trick, and I'll show you what I mean. Now, what they used to do is they'd have two ADF receivers. We don't have that luxury here. We unfortunately only have the one. So we're gonna have to actually swap between the two. Our goal is to try to get the two needles to overlap each other. Now, do you notice right now it's kind of sitting to the west? Now, watch what happens when I swap here. Do you see how that one is slightly closer to the center? This is the outer of the two beacons. I'm sorry, um, let me check my notes here. This is the inner of the two beacons. So this one represents where the runway itself is. 
this one right here on 372, I'm sorry, 732, let me get my stuff right. I was right the first time. This is the one that represents the actual airport's position. This one, 372, I thought so, represents the position of the approach. So what we need to do is we need to get those two to overlap each other. So see almost pointing towards west? When I swing back to the inner beacon, you can see that one's slightly to the right of west. What that means is that we are slightly too far south. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap over to our outer one here. This is a 372, and I'm going to get that to kind of center up here. It's going to require a left turn. It's also going to require that we lose a little bit of altitude here, but that's okay. Notice, by the way, I still have no signal on the VOR here. <laughs> I've been trying to use that this entire time, and it gives me a DME reading. Now, what's my situation? Now, if I were to pull this down, again, this is going to be a much easier visual for you if you take a look. We are currently tracking this NDB station here, and then the inside one is here. So you'll notice here that I'm more or less pointing towards this one. Now, watch what happens when I switch to 732. The beacon's needle should shift to the left. Ding! See how it went slightly to the left? That means, even though I was pointing towards the correct one, I need to come to the left a little bit to basically align myself with the two beacons. Now, if I come here like this, let's take a look. You can see, ah, oh, that's a little bit to the left too. So that means both of them are more or less aligned with each other, which means I need to execute a very, very gentle left turn to basically get myself realigned up at that lovely runway. Uh, we're looking at uh, runway 27 today, by the way. So we're actually pretty good as far as uh, alignment goes. So not bad, not bad at all. There we go. So it still looks like that one's slightly to the left. Let's go switch again. And that one's perfect. So the 732, remember, is going to be the runway itself the 372 is going to be its approach. So you see how that one is basically perfect. So more or less, we are pointing directly at the end of the runway. If anything, we can come to the left like one degree. Now those two needles should be more or less equal to each other. Eh, that's shifting a little bit. Uh, when the inside of the runway starts to shift, I know that we're starting to drift a little south here. So we actually have to come back north a little bit. Just a little bit. Switch to this one again. Let's see, we're pointing more or less. Again, remember, if the wind was coming out of the south, this would be very irritating <laughs> because it would basically be pointing us off course here. Woo, this is going to be a fun landing. Let's go ahead and get everything ready here. Woo, that didn't do anything for me except making me blind. Does that help? Eh, a little bit. Let's see, kind of turn one of them on. Yeah, that one's kind of out of the way, but I'm not going to lie. It's just making things glow. All right, there we go. Let's go ahead and do another switch. Okay, so I can see the inside, um, yes. So 732 is the inside. This is the runway itself. It's more or less perfectly lined up here. I want to pop over to 372. That's the outside aspect of the outside NDB. It is slightly to my left, which means I'm pointing at the airport, but my actual approach myself is actually slightly to the left. So we need to actually bring our course in like two degrees to the left here to basically realign ourselves with it. All right, this should be nice and centered up. Theoretically, when I switch to this one, they should be more or less in the same position. Oh, yes. Look at that. Oh, we got it. We got it. All right, let's start our descent here. We got plenty of room. Let's go ahead and drop this down about 2,000. It's not going to be 2,000. We'll arm that. Arm vertical speed. Um, we're going to take about 1,000 feet per About 1,500 feet. I'm going to do 1,800. I got to reduce power a little bit, though, because otherwise we're going to come rocketing down. Cow flaps closed. All right, remember, 732 is the runway. We're perfect. We are textbook perfect right now. So basically, because the two positions are overlapping each other, that means we're in the feather of the runway's approach here. Back the power up just a little bit more. We can go down to 20. Cow flaps will keep us from overfreezing. So what we're looking at now is just monitoring these. See how this is starting to shift a little bit? Well, it's actually staying about the same. So we're on the approach. That looks good to me. Yeah, we're perfect. We're basically perfect. If anything, I can come to the right by like one degree and that'd be like, I'm afraid to touch it. <laughs> All right, there's the river. That's a good sign for us. Oh boy. Yeah, see it's slightly to the right now. Let me come about a degree to the right. Now, the thing you have to watch out for when you're doing approaches like this, and this is very true, is when you cross the station, this needle is going to flip. 
So basically, we're trying to use this station to line us up at the runway, and we're gonna use the other station to get us down onto the runway. So it's okay to basically chase this one, but when this one dances, we've got to flop over to the other frequency, otherwise we're gonna miss it. And if you look out the window, do you see what I see? Ta-da! Now watch this. If you look down at the ADF needle, or the, yep. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold this. This would be very, very, very bad for this engine. But uh, we'll do a low approach. Did you see how the needle just went boing and flipped? Now watch this. I'll switch back to 732. Now check this out. See how it's pointing directly to the end of the runway? Isn't that awesome? Uniform Tango Delta Delta, by the way, if you're curious. We're gonna do the low approach. Now, believe it or not, this runway is uh, something like 10,000 feet long. And uh, the reason for that, of course, is the incredible, incredible amount of uh, heat they actually get here during the summer. And there's our runway 27. Now, if you watch, see how the needle flipped once again? Because now the approach is on the opposite side. Again, we're just doing the low approach here. Isn't that awesome? So hopefully this encourages you to give ADF a try. Uh, it's very cool. There's not a lot of ADF stations left in the United States. Of course, uh, the reason being is the fact that uh, there's just not a lot of need for it anymore. So um, like I said, they basically decommissioned most of it. Everything is VOR and GPS these days, but it's kind of fun to do things the old fashioned way. Enjoy.